This all started a few hours ago. It was supposed to be my day off and I had already planned to lay around in my house and eat junk food all day long. I hauled a bunch of snacks and drinks to the living room, not feeling even a little bit of regret over the few pounds that I was about to put on. I turned on the TV and I jumped on the couch, scrolling through Facebook while the movie played in the background on the screen. It must have been about 5pm when I got bored and decided to stretch my legs a little. When I returned from my excuse for a healthy smoke break, I saw that the movie on the TV was gone and was instead replaced with one of those emergency broadcast screens with colorful rectangles. A male voice resounded from the TV. Repeat, do not leave your homes under any circumstances. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. And then a five second pause. Attention citizens, this is an emergency broadcast. For your own safety, please lock your doors and windows immediately and do not leave your home under any circumstances. Repeat, do not leave your home under any circumstances. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. The message kept replaying. I flicked through some channels only to be met with static. At first, I laughed at the absurdity of the situation. This can't be real, can it? And then it hit me. Maybe we were under attack. North Korea or maybe somebody else. In any case, I turned off the TV and decided to lock my doors and shut all the windows, covering them with the blinds along the way. Before I did though, I peered out of the window, only to be greeted with an empty street and nothing suspicious. I sat back on my couch and messaged my friend on Facebook, asking him if he saw the same broadcast. He didn't respond, though, and Messenger said that he was online ten minutes ago. As I scrolled through the rest of the feed, I saw nothing out of the ordinary on my friend's feeds. I googled the news, looking at my town, but there was nothing. I started to relax a little, beginning to think that this was indeed all either a prank or a technical error. But then I heard something outside. It sounded like someone cackling, but it only lasted for about a second before it had stopped. I held my breath and listened, hearing another cackle in the process, equally short and disturbing. And then a feminine scream that was suddenly cut off. It was as if whoever was screaming was suddenly muted with a pause button. I approached the door carefully, looking through the peephole, but I saw nothing out of the ordinary. And then another very short and barely audible scream. I decided to go to the window thinking that I might see more. I slowly pulled the blinds aside, just enough to see a portion of the street and my heart almost exploded. Standing right in front of me, with her face to the glass, was a woman staring right at me. Her eyes were bloodshot and opened so widely that they looked like they would pop out. She was snarling, showing teeth that were stained with dark red liquid and causing the window to fog up every second or so. Her hair was messy and dirty and her nails were caked with dirt. I screamed and backed away knocking down my table lamp in the process. I stood there for a while, staring at the blinds, knowing the woman was just behind them, since I could occasionally hear a faint tap and scratch on the glass from her nails. And then she spoke. Open the door, please, please, they'll find me. I stood there dumbfounded. Please, I know you're in there. Just open the door. I reached for my phone and dialed 911 with trembling hands, 
but I was met with a dead line. I tried a few times, but there was no service. Please, let me in. Let us in. A male voice joined the woman at the window. And then another one at the door. And another and another. Until my entire house was surrounded by a reverberating cacophony of pleading voices. Some desperate sounding and others impatient and aggressive. I retreated to the stairs, waiting for them to go away. After what seemed like an eternity, they started shutting up one by one until I was left with a deafening silence that I was grateful for. Did they get bored and decided to leave me alone? I decided to peer out of my peephole to see if it was safe. When I did, I barely stopped myself from gasping loudly. Through the peephole, I could see a middle-aged man's face with bloodshot eyes, just standing there, not moving, staring at my door. Around him were more people, just staring blankly at the walls and windows. I backed away and would approach the door every few minutes since then. They've been standing in front of my house for five hours now. I waited and waited. I foolishly kept glancing outside to see if they had left. It was almost dark and I felt like I was losing my mind. I even contemplated opening the door thinking that they might not want to harm me. And as a last resort, I held my kitchen knife close so that I could try to fight them off or, in the worst case scenario, turn the knife on myself. Thoughts raced through my head about them breaking in and ripping me apart limb by limb with their bare hands. So I did not want to find out what they planned to do to me and how creative they were. As I sat there trying not to make any noise, I decided to peer outside one last time. Looking outside, I was faced with the same people, standing in the same position, still staring at my house. But then, there was a sound. Something that sounded like three deliberate gunshots a few blocks away. Almost instantly, the people jerked their heads towards the sound and without any hesitation, started sprinting towards the source. Some of them screaming along the way or making animalistic sounds. I thought there may have been like 10 or 20 of them surrounding my house, but I was wrong. As I was looking through the peephole to see them leaving, more and more of them just kept running past my house, almost for an entire minute, which made me think for a moment that the horde would never end. But eventually, all went still and there was no person or sound remaining anywhere in the vicinity of my house. That's it. I'm safe, I thought. I put my back against the door and I breathed a sigh of relief. And then I heard another voice. I looked back through the people and saw somebody across the street. A woman and man, both middle-aged, were moving cautiously towards my house in a crouched position. The woman had an axe and the man seemed to be carrying a baseball bat. Come on, they'll be back soon. The woman gestured for the man to follow her and they stopped right in front of my house. Come on, they'll be back soon. The woman gestured for the man to follow her and they stopped right in front of my house. Hey, you there. She tried to speak quietly, but loud enough for me to hear. Hey, she knocked on the door. You need to come with us now. Those lunatics will be back soon. I clutched the knife harder and I held my breath. Look, we're not one of them. Now come on and open the door. He's not going to open it. The man shook his head. Come on, let's go. Maybe it was the fact that I desperately wanted to not be alone anymore in that moment, but I quickly unlocked the door and opened it slightly. Hey, I called out to them from behind the door, concealing the knife. 
Oh, finally, the lady said. Come on, they'll be back soon. We need to evacuate. Wait a minute. The broadcast said that we should stay inside, I argued. Oh, forget that. There's no help coming. Now come on, or we'll leave into the evac site without you. I knew there was no time to argue and much less time to prepare supplies to bring before those freaks returned. So I just locked my house and left the keys in the nearby bushes. I'm Angela, by the way, and this is Travis, the lady said. It should be safe to leave the neighborhood this way. I introduced myself and asked what was going on. I don't know exactly. People just started acting crazy. The town's been quarantined, but there's one checkpoint where we can get out. They got soldiers there, Travis said with his raspy voice. It should be safe to wait for this to blow over outside town. How do you know? I asked. Now, I don't for sure, but it's our best bet. At first, we gotta find our guy, Angela said. He insisted on firing a few shots to distract them and to save your butt. He'll meet us at the gas station. The walk to the gas station was uneventful. The streets were empty, but we did see crashed cars and a few dead bodies from a distance. I had never seen a corpse before, let alone mangled and butchered ones like these. So I tried to look away and not think how these people had died. No crazy people were on the street though, or anyone alive for that matter. When we got to the station, there was a young man waiting there. He couldn't have been more than 18. Hey Ricky, nice work back there. Angela greeted him. Here's the guy you were risking your butt for. Hey, I owe you one man. I shook his head and awaited for the group to give further instructions. Hey Travis, you okay? Angela asked him and when I glanced at him, I saw that he was pale. Yeah, just tired is all. I'm gonna use the restroom. He replied and disappeared inside the gas station. Ricky suggested that we scavenge the remaining food in the station so we went inside. The inside of the gas station looked like it was left in a panicked hurry. Some of the items were knocked over, the floor stained with liquid from broken bottles, and the majority of the shelves left pillaged. Ricky assured us that he had already scouted the place and that it was safe, but I still felt uneasy, as if one of those people would jump me from around the corner. I gathered whatever I deemed necessary, like chocolate bars, chips, water, and of course, some cigs. You never know when you might need them. I went into the restroom to take a leak when I heard a loud crash from inside. Travis, you okay? I called out to him. I heard his voice, but he didn't respond. It sounded like he was having a heated discussion with someone. Travis? I heard him from inside one of the stalls, so I called out his name. He was whispering loudly, murmurs that I couldn't make out. I carefully approached the stall and stopped, listening to him. I was able to grab only a few phrases in his indistinct chatter, like, can't get away, out, 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 and feed them to something. Hey Travis, are you okay in there? I asked and against my better judgment decided to slowly open the door. Before I could even realize what was going on, Travis had burst out of the stall and jumped on top of me knocking me on my back. I held him back as he thrashed against me. His face was all red and his eyes were bloodshot, veins bulging from his neck and forehead so violently that they looked like they could explode at any moment. Outside, no control, find the host, he screamed, the gibberish, his spit flying all over me. Hey, get off me. 
I tried to pull him off, but he was too strong. The door of the bathroom burst open and Angela and Ricky ran in, shouting at Travis to stop it. A few moments of frenetic screaming, shouting and struggling, and then Travis went completely limp. I pushed him off, only then realizing that there was a fire axe embedded in his forehead. His eyes were wide open, still bloodshot, and a pool of blood was forming on the floor around his head. I backed away to the wall, breathing heavily, and as the adrenaline subsided, I started to feel a burning sensation all over my arms. I had deep scratches and spit from Travis all over them. Oh no, 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 no. I stared at the scratches, my hands trembling uncontrollably. This is it, I thought. All those zombie movies that I watched and this is how it ends. Dang it, Travis. I barely heard Angela say while standing over his body. She and Ricky discussed something, but I was in my own world then. Hey, you okay? Angela shook me out of my trance. He, he infected me, I said with a trembling voice. No, oh, you're fine, she responded. But the virus... He scratched me and I think I got some of his spit in my mouth and on my wounds. This isn't a virus. Angela shook her head. It's a parasite and we all have it inside us. Parasite? I was still in shock from everything that had just happened. I thought you said you didn't know what was going on. Angela sighed. I work for the town's pharmaceutical company as a secretary. When this all started today, I got a message on the company phone from my coworker Daniel. He was very vague, but he told me not to go to work today, that it's not safe in town. He said there's a people killing parasite which is immune to medication and that we all have it, so we should take antibiotics to suppress its growth. That's all that I know. What? Ricky interjected. That's crazy. I know how it sounds, Angela continued. Look, Daniel is a researcher at the lab, so I'm sure that he knows something more than we do, and he's not one to exaggerate. Well, where is he now? I asked. He hasn't responded to any of my messages. For all we know, he could already be dead. And the last thing that he sent me was that we should evacuate via the bridge. He said the army will be there. Our best bet right now is to reach that evac point. But if we're all infected, there's no way that we can leave town, I said. I know, Angela responded. Look, the government is organizing an evacuation for a reason. They might have a cure for this, or at least a temporary solution. Ricky and I agreed. I asked about finding some guns, but they disagreed, stating that it would be suicide. Those freaks were very, very perceptive, and firing even a single bullet could swarm hundreds of them on us in a matter of seconds. That meant that cars were out of the question, too. They also told me that they also seemed to work as a beehive, cooperating really well with each other and not attacking their own. On top of all that, they seemed to retain some form of intelligent thinking, which explained their behavior in front of my house. And by the time that we were stocked up with food and water and it was already dark, but Angela suggested that we move now for better cover. The checkpoint was supposedly not far away, so it wouldn't take longer than an hour to reach it. We each took one antibiotic pill which Angela had on her, hoping against hope that it would slow down the parasites until we had reached the checkpoint. I expected the town to be filled with screams and other and inhuman sounds made by those things, and I was right. The sounds were distant but always present all around us. A scream here, a crash there, putting all three of us on edge, carefully taking every step and frantically looking behind and around us. 
At one point, there was a loud scream right behind us, and as we turned around, we saw a naked man running one block away and disappearing around the corner. We wait, not sure if he was toying with us. A few seconds later, another scream was heard from the adjacent street where the man had just vanished. The next few seconds were a mixture of two screams, one violent and blood-curdling and the other pleading, along with the sound of loud pummeling, until the latter was the only sound that remained. I wanted to help whoever was in trouble there, but Angela stopped me and silently shook her head. All three of us just moved on without a single word to each other. As we neared the bridge, the horrid sounds around us slowly started fading away, until the only sound remaining was our own footsteps, echoing throughout the street. After an excruciating hour of sneaking and praying that we don't run into one of those people who would attract others, we finally made it to the bridge. There was a makeshift barricade made from barbed wire and cement bags. There were dozens of corpses strewn about in the road in front and on the bridge itself. One even slumped across the barricade, making the entire scene look like a war massacre. We ducked behind a wall and observed the bridge. On the other side of it, at the end of the street, was a tall wall, which hadn't been there before. I remember asking myself how they had managed to cordon off the entire city so quickly. And do you see anybody there? Angela asked. It looks deserted. I squinted my eyes, trying to detect any signs of movement across the bridge. The army guys must be ahead. Let's check it out, Ricky said. Wait, we have to be careful here, Angela interjected. What if there's no checkpoint at all, or if they mistake us for some of those lunatics? What choice do we have? We're running out of time here, I'll go first. Stay behind me and watch our backs. Ricky stood up and started towards the bridge before Angela or I could argue any further. We watched as Ricky jumped over the barricade with great finesse and we followed carefully stepping around the dead bodies in pools of dried blood. Looking at the corpses made me feel uneasy. There were women and children here, mothers embracing their children in their final moments. Angela mumbled, Oh my God, to herself next to me and said, Were all these people trying to evacuate but didn't make it? I don't know, I shook my head but these people were definitely not the freaks. I inadvertently started to think about what could have happened here and how these people felt in those last moments. Just as I was about to entertain that morbid thought, Ricky called out to us from across the bridge. Uh, guys? He was kneeling over one of the dead bodies in the road. I don't think there's going to be an evac. What do you mean? I asked. He pointed to the body that he was inspecting and then stood up, putting his arms on his hips. These bodies all have bullet holes in them, he gestured to us. I think this was the army's doing. What happened next was too fast for my brain to process. There was a glint on top of a wall, Angela screaming Ricky's name, a loud bang that echoed through the street and Ricky's head kicking forward from the bullet's impact as he went limp and fell down without a sound, the poor kid probably never even realizing what hit him. Contact! We heard somebody yell from the wall as a hail of bullets started being fired in our direction, barely missing us by a thread. Angela and I quickly stumbled backwards, running for our lives frantically, while the sound of bullets persisted. We ran for what felt like miles until the gunshots faded and then finally stopped completely. We stopped in the middle of the street, breathing heavily and trying to process what the heck just happened. But the silence didn't last for long. 
because the sound of bullets was quickly replaced with a different, equally ominous one. The screams of the freaks which froze your bones to the marrow, bringing along with them impending doom. Their death cries were all around us now, and they were drawing closer by the second. I frantically looked around for some desperate way out of this situation. The screams were so loud now that I expected the freaks to appear from around the corner any second and swarm us. I noticed a small store with an open sign on the door so I tried it with all my strength, hoping to God that it would unlock. To my surprise, the door easily gave way, making me stumble headfirst inside. Angela, come on! I called out to my surviving partner, who seemed to be preoccupied frantically looking around, clutching her axe. Angela! I yelled again, and she snapped her head to me and practically jumped inside. I shut the door and ducked behind the counter just in time to see a dozen freaks run past us on the street, all screaming along the way and muttering some gibberish, just like Travis did. Angela and I silently stared at each other, breathing heavily and probably thinking the same thing. What the heck just happened? The gunshots started again, but were very distant this time. The screamers all seemed to be flocking to the sound of gunfire, which was good for us. A few more minutes passed as we listened to the cacophony of bullets and screaming with an occasional freak running past the store. Eventually, Angela and I started to regain our composure when all the outside noise had died down. They shot Ricky, she said looking down. They shot him. Listen, we need to keep moving. I approached her, glancing at the street every couple of seconds. We're not safe here and evacuation obviously isn't happening. Do you know of any other safe places that we can go to? She thought for a second with her eyes closed, as if she had trouble recalling. Uh, the only other place I know is my company. She finally responded. It's got pretty good security and, but I don't know if it's safe there now. Other staff members could be infected there. Well, it's our only option now. The pharmaceutical company is not too far from here, right? Yeah, we should be there in no time. I have an access card. She seemed to find me snap out of her trance and focus. Alright, here's what we do. We go to your company and we wait it out for a few days. If it has good security, maybe your coworker Daniel and some other people could be working on a cure, right? I don't know, it's a long shot. They could all be dead or gone by now and the building overrun. Look. Your co-worker is the one who told you that this was a parasite and that we can slow it down with antibiotics. He might just might know something more. And since the government doesn't plan to let us out, we might as well see if we can get treated first and then look for another way out. Okay, okay, she nodded. Let's go check it out. If there is even the slightest chance of survivors being there that we need to get there. And if it's deserted, we can still stay there for a bit until we figure out our next move. And if the freaks are there, and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, right? All right, let's go. I clutched Travis's baseball bat and peeked outside through the glass door. It looks safe enough. So we slowly exited the store and started making our way to the destination. The pharmaceutical company is at an intersection, so we gotta be really careful, Angela said. Sure enough, as soon as we had exited the alleys and reached the main street, we saw a bunch of freaks scattered on the road, aimlessly walking around between abandoned cars and dead bodies. Their footsteps looked unnatural almost as if they forgot how to walk and were now learning it from scratch. From time to time they would scream, shout some gibberish or even violently cough and ratch. Oh, we can use the garage to get to the entrance, Angela said and pointed to a security barrier, 
which opened to an underground garage. And carefully, we descended down, making sure that we made as little noise as possible. The outside noises faded once we had reached the bottom, which greatly improved our morale. A lot of the cars over here seemed untouched. Only a couple vehicles were crashed and left like that, so whoever had parked here never had a chance to escape. And we stuck to the walls, and it's a good thing too, because soon we heard another discontinued scream. We froze in our tracks, trying to identify where it was coming from, but it was difficult due to the echo and the size of the garage. Another scream echoed. Had they found us? We waited for what seemed like ages, but nothing happened. I decided to take a peek and realized that there was one man in a business suit standing in the middle of the garage. He was facing away from us, just standing and his head twitching every now and then in an uncontrolled motion. The door is right there. Angela whispered, pointing to the left of the freak. I thought about sneaking past him and there was a good chance that we could have made it, but it was a gamble. Give me your axe. I told her and she hesitantly gave it to me asking what I was doing. I looked around again to see if there was anybody else in the garage, but it seemed clear. Stay here until I take care of him and if he sees me, don't try to help me. We're both just going to get killed. I inhaled deeply and started taking very slow steps towards the freak. I held my breath, afraid that even the slightest noise would alert him. The freak shrieked and then went silent. He hadn't seen me yet. Step by step, I got closer and as I did, I was able to hear him more clearly. The freak was muttering something between moans and head jerks. No, can't do it break free he said among other things i was only a few feet away from him now he screamed louder which made me stop dead in my tracks my heart was pounding a million miles per hour this is it i thought he's gonna turn around and in a matter of seconds his friends will join in and rip me apart but he just went silent again and continued doing what he was doing before I gripped the axe as tightly as I could, exhaling silently and bracing myself. Before I could give myself the chance to chicken out, I raised the axe above my head and brought it down with full force. The freak jerked his head in my direction one last time, just in time to see me but it was too late. The axe connected with his collarbone, bringing him down to his knees with blood spurting everywhere. He tried to open his mouth to utter something, but only a soft gasp came out before he fell sideways, his eyes still open as the pool of blood started to form around him. Oh crap, I gasped at the sudden realization of what I had just done. I felt sick all of a sudden and I had eaten prior to that, I would have emptied the contents of my stomach. I just killed a human. I stared at the body for what seemed like ages, thinking about whether this man had a family and what his name was, until I felt a tap on my shoulder. Hey, we gotta go. Angela reminded me and I nodded, unable to say a word. He snatched her axe from the dead body and said, You had to do it. If you hadn't killed him, you can bet your buddy would have done it to you. She approached the door and swiped her card in the reader, which made a loud beeping sound. The sturdy door unlocked. I took one final look at the man in the suit and his empty gaze, before Angela reminded me that we had to go. Oh, thank God. She sighed as the door closed behind us. Let's... The male voice suddenly resounded on the loudspeakers. Angela, is that you? Daniel? She responded, looking around for the source. A moment of silence and the voice crackled back to life. Come on up to the second floor. I have something important to show you. Well, come on up, it's safe. The voice repeated. 
I'm in the security realm. Angela and I looked at each other in bewilderment. She led us upstairs to the second floor through the once pristine hallways that were now decorated with knocked over garbage bins, broken vending machines, and from what I could see, some staff members. We rounded the corner and reached the door with the security sign. Angela was about to open the door, but I stopped her, recalling how they surrounded my house and tried to trick me into letting them in. For all we knew, Daniel was already dead or worse. But before we could consider our next move, the door swung open and in front of us appeared a man in a lab coat, staring us down. It took you long enough, he said in a matter-of-factly tone and went back inside the room. And we followed. Inside were a dozen monitors which were tracking movement via surveillance cameras throughout the building. I noticed movement on some of the feeds from those freaks, walking aimlessly about certain sections of the building and outside, just like the ones on the street we saw earlier. Daniel sat in the security guard's chair and faced us. I only then noticed the gun next to him on the desk. Dan, I thought you were dead, Angela said. My thought exactly. I heard the armies killing our own, so when I told you to go there, he shook his head. I tried contacting you again to prevent you from going there, but I couldn't reach you. I'm sorry, I should have known. Angela shrugged after a moment of silence. And Dan, you said that it was some sort of parasite. Now is there a cure for it? She asked. There's no cure. He responded with hesitation and my heart dropped. But you can slow it down with antibiotics. But even then, it's just a matter of time before the parasite develops resistance. We tried finding a cure, but we failed. What is this parasite? I asked. Dan sighed and nodded. Ever heard of Toxoplasma Gandhi? He asked. I didn't respond. Toxoplasma gondii, Dan repeated, a parasite which can only thrive in the intestines of cats. It infects a rat and takes over its mind. It then allows the rat to become easy prey and be eaten by the cat, which ingests the parasite and voila, it lives a happy life. Now the parasite itself doesn't harm humans. It causes some minor behavioral changes, yes but people can live with it or without ever knowing that they have it. This wasn't all just an accident, was it? Angela and I listened carefully, holding our breath. No, Dan sighed, looking embarrassed. No, it wasn't. He continued after a short pause. The government was highly intrigued by these psychological changes T. Gandhi caused in humans, so they thought... What if we could control the parasite and use it to our advantage? So they established a fake pharmaceutical company in this town and moved us to conduct the project here. They hired some citizens like Angela to retain the image of a normal company. But behind the scenes, we were experimenting with T. Gandhi. But why? I asked. Why use it? Well, lots of reasons but the main one was creating an obedient and compliant nation. That was the initial goal at least. After the initial success of manipulating T. Gandhi and making sure the behavioral changes it caused in humans would be the ones that they desired, the guys in command gave orders to start infecting the citizens. What? Angela was appalled. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. We administered the parasite via throat swabs and tongue depressors. You probably remember the precaution the town had in order to prevent a possible Ebola outbreak five months ago. All citizens had to complete a mandatory throat culture and were therefore infected without even knowing it. The ones who moved out of the city in the meantime were tracked carefully. They'd probably been neutralized or arrested by now. I thought about all of this for a second. I never took the throat culture, I replied. How? Dan asked. 
I hadn't moved here by then. Well then, unless you ingested some feces which contain this specific parasite, you're safe. I felt a surge of new hope. I felt as if I could run for miles. Dan continued. Anyway, everything was fine at first. The town's crime rate started dropping, more stability in the city and so on. In fact, it was so well run that the top guys planned on running another experiment in which they could engineer the parasite into causing different behavioral changes and use it as a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, but then things got out of hand, Angela asked. Yep. People started complaining about feeling sick and then there were reports of violent attacks and, well, you know the rest. I've observed some of the infected and apparently what happens is exactly like with the rats. The parasite takes control over the host. I don't know if the host is still aware, but my guess is he is. Probably like some other parasites, the host just can't control his actions. So why would the parasite cause this kind of violent behavior? I asked. My guess is they want full control. They probably control most of the neurons in the host, but not all of them. My mind went back to all the things that I had heard the freaks say since this all began. Find the host, no control, out. See this? Dan pointed to the camera feed in which we saw a freak at the front entrance, twitching and holding his head, as if he was in pain. Whatever human is left in that body is fighting for control but the parasite is too strong. He turned back to us. After the outbreak, the government announced evac at a few checkpoints in the city, but they changed their plans when they realized the severity of the situation. Our research team was to be extracted in case of an outbreak, but they never showed up, leaving us here to die. All those years working for them and this is how they repay us. He stood up and paced around, he raised his index finger and continued. But the government doesn't know one thing. When they moved their research here, the team was aware of a potential outbreak, and the head of the research built a secret exit unbeknownst to his superiors. That's how most of the staff escaped from here. They're outside the city already, no doubt about it. Wait, they got out? Angela interrupted. Daniel reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a key. This key was given only to the research team. He gave it to Angela. Inside the storage on the second floor basement is a fenced off area which you can open with this key. From there it's a straight shot from the sewers to freedom. The superiors were always told that it was a waste dump, so they never suspected anything. Oh, what about you? she asked. He smiled vaguely and sat back down. There's no escape from what I've done. This is my purgatory. You better go. It's only a matter of time before the government purges the city. Just then, a loud crash could be heard from downstairs. All three of us glanced at the camera feed only to see the freaks crashing through the glass doors at the entrance. Crap. It looks like we're out of time. Dan said and shoved his gun to Angela. Dan. Angela started, but he raised his hand and silenced her. Go, he said impatiently. I'll distract them for you. Without hesitation, Angela and I sprinted down the corridor, which was already had screams reverberating throughout it and called the elevator. We waited, hoping that it would arrive before the freaks did, and when it finally did... We jumped in and hit the B2 button. The last thing that we heard before the doors closed was Dan's voice shouting, Over here, you infected freaks. And the screams becoming even more violent, if that was even possible. The sounds of their footsteps and screams echoed through the pipes all around the elevator as we descended and we prayed it would not stop before reaching the basement. The screams grew weaker and a few seconds later, the doors opened and we stood in a dark hallway. 
Another very loud shriek echoed as one freak came right at us. But before he could reach us, Angela put a bullet in his forehead, silencing him permanently. We sprinted through the dark basement until we reached a sturdy-looking door. He used the key to open it and ushered me inside the dark, cluttered room which was the storage. On the other side of the room was a gated fence which led to a dark passage. Angela unlocked it and motioned for me to go first. I rushed inside and as I did, I heard the sound of doors closing and a key turning in the hole. I turned around and saw Angela standing behind the gate, a look of defeat on her face. Angela, what are you doing? I asked. She shook her head. This is the end of the line for me. Angela, wait, maybe you're okay, we can... I can already feel myself changing. You have to go without me. I was at a loss for words and I knew she was right, but my brain was looking for an alternate solution. Angela wiped her tears and reached into her pocket, pulling out a picture. She glanced at it and let out a loud sob. She then handed it to me and upon inspecting, I saw that it was a picture of a little girl in a school uniform, smiling widely. And that's my daughter Helena, she said. Her address is on the back. Please find her and give it to her. Angela, come on, you can give it to yourself once we're out. The screams in the distance were starting to grow louder again. She shook her head and sniffled, wiping away her newly formed tears. Promise me. She grabbed my hand through the fence firmly. Promise me you'll find her. I nodded and uttered the words with a trembling voice. I promise. Good. I'm gonna give these freaks a memorable farewell. She dropped her backpack on the ground and readied her gun. The screams which we had heard on the upper floors prior to this were now permeating the basement in full force. Angela! I called out to her and she looked back to me. Thank you, I said. She nodded and disappeared out of the room. The next few seconds were a mixture of screams and gunshots until all that remained were just the screams. I closed my eyes and I wiped the tears. I barely had the motivation to move but I knew that I had to go. I had to get out and find Helena. The next few hours were a blur, trudging through smelly water in the sewers with barely navigatable corridors until I finally saw the rays of sunlight coming between bars of another fence gate. It was unlocked, luckily, and I stepped outside into a canal filled with mud and probably crap. I heard the whirring of a helicopter and looked above in time to see it fly under the morning sun in the direction of the city. I glanced back, seeing the city which was now cordoned off by huge walls and military vehicles all around it. They were far away from me though, so I was safe. I pulled out Angela's picture to make sure that it was still in my pocket, and I looked at the back of it. Below the address was Angela's personal message scrawled in a hurry. It said, Mommy will always be proud of you, even if it means I can't always be there for you. I love you more than anything, baby. Mom. P.S. Listen to your dad while I'm not around. I suppressed the tears which I felt welling up in my eyes and put the picture back in my pocket. I changed my identity after that. News of the outbreak spread quickly and the media showed the death toll with the names of all the people who had died, including my own. The CBDC explained the incident to the media as an unfortunate outbreak of an unknown virus. They further mentioned that the city had to be completely sterilized and the situation was now under control. According to the news, there were no survivors.
Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard me speak about HelloFresh before and there's a reason for it. I've been using HelloFresh for a while now and honestly, I love it. It's the perfect way to try new foods and at the same time, not break the budget. It also helps me elevate my cooking skill instead of always opting to order takeout instead. Just the other night, I had the chicken sausage and spinach ricotta ravioli, and it was honestly really good. It took me about 15 or 20 minutes to prep, and after that I was eating and enjoying my meal. This is definitely a recipe that I wouldn't have made on my own without HelloFresh, so I'm happy to have tried it and I'll definitely be trying it again. HelloFresh takes the stress out of mealtime by delivering fresh ingredients and easy recipes right to your door, and I can pledge by it. Plus, with fall rolling around and the season changing, HelloFresh will be offering its new fall lineup of delicious dinners and more to choose from, so I'm pretty excited about that. And to get started for yourself, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Creeps and use code 50 Mr. Creeps for 50% off, plus 15% off for the next two months. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 Mr. Creeps, and use code 50 Mr. Creeps for 50% off, plus 15% off for the next two months. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. If you're in the market for a new mattress, then you're in luck. Ghostbed's big Labor Day sale is happening right now. Our friends at Ghostbed make incredibly high quality mattresses and right now you can get your hands on one for a fraction of the cost. Each Ghostbed is made with high quality supportive materials and signature cooling material that draws heat away from your body. No more waking up in a pool of sweat even in the dead of summer. Purchasing a new mattress from Ghostbed is risk-free with an industry-leading warranty, 101 night sleep trial, and free shipping. Plus, Ghostbed's sleep expert team is standing by to help you find the perfect bed for you. Head to Ghostbed.com now to take advantage of their Labor Day sale and save big. Use code Mr. Creeps for 40% off site-wide. Head to Ghostbed.com slash Creepscast now to get started.